Next, we have somebody that's going to really tie into what we already did because my concern always is when you guys go back, how do you become that minority voice on a board? And how, how can you get people to actually think about what, what, they're, what they need to be thinking about? And how do you share? How can a minority make a majority work? And I don't know if that's a good enough description, but Dr. Kelly Coles is an awesome lady. And listen to her, and you will have come out with more advice, good advice. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming. And I wish, wish, wish we had alternatives like this organization when I was on the school board. I was elected in 2010, and I stayed on that school board for four years. It was a very, very difficult four years. And then I was appointed by that board to another career center board. So I served on two public school boards. And I was elected against the odds. I was told by many people that I would never get elected. The reason was because I was a no voter. Do you guys understand that? We had local levies. And the school district had ran four levies. They needed $30 million, and they ran four levies. I put a no sign at the end of my driveway for every one. I was clearly not holding back that I opposed a tax increase. And so I ran for board because my neighbor said, you should run for board. And I said, yeah, that's not my, that's not my thing. I've got a private practice. I've got a family. I've got a household. I have to run these things. Um, but they said, no, I, I think you should run for board. And doggone it, that was on my heart and on my head for another month or two. And I thought, somebody's putting this charge in me, maybe I will. I had no idea what I was in for, though. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't do any pre-boarding. I loved that idea. I definitely wrote that in bold, that I have to start pre-boarding people now. But that would have been extremely helpful. But in my head, that's what was in my head. I had five children in this district. I had almost everything I own invested in that house. I had every interest in making that school successful. And yes, I want to get on the board. I wanted to see, and I told the public, I wanted to see if they need the money. If they need the money, I would support it. But I thought that maybe what they were missing was accountability. And boy, that was a bad word, right? I just said, let me get in there and let me see. Just let me see. That's OK. Well, the newspaper endorsed the other three candidates. The teachers union endorsed the other three candidates, essentially telling people who not to vote for. That night, I got more votes than anybody else. And the newspaper called and said, congratulations. I said, well, it kind of tells you that the paper should stop trying to make the news and just report it, right? Because they're involved in endorsing. And he said, point taken, point taken. So I got on the board. And trust me, the other four people were pro-levy people. So they didn't like that this no voter got on the board. They didn't like me at all. They didn't know me. They didn't know my principles, my values. They didn't know what I came there for. They just didn't like me right, because I was different from them. I went through the training, the school board association training, and that weekend I was, uh, you know, told all these things, the executive session, uh, sunshine law, all that good stuff that people need to know, as an, any elected official needs to know. But I was also told things that didn't sit right, didn't pass what I call my smell test, like you need to be a cheerleader for your district, you need to do what the superintendent and treasurer tell you to do, you hired them, now you trust them, you've got to support them. Um, don't walk through the buildings, it makes people nervous, you have to present a united front. Stuff like this, I'm thinking, okay, this is nauseating me, because I'm pretty sure that's not why I was elected. And I would look around the room and I think, are all these people sucking this up? And the answer was yes, they were. Thought, Darn, uh, my job's a lot harder now, because I have to get on the board and say, okay, that's not what I plan on doing here. I don't plan on rocking any boats, but I plan on expressing what the community is saying. So my first few meetings were rough. They didn't like me, and they said so repeatedly. <laughs> they threw down their pencils, walked out of meetings, and all I was doing was saying, I think the community is saying something else, right? So I wanted to have a couple slides. I don't know if I'm in control of them. Is it up here? Uh, Whoa, there you are. Thank you. OK, so is having board majority necessary to getting the board's job done? And I think we just had an 
awesome presentation on what our job really is. And it's this outcome-based education. What is our job in education? It's to educate. How can we measure that? How can we assure the community that we're on top of things? If all we're talking about is school bus color, right? Is, is it important? Uh, do you need a board majority to get things done? I'd have to say no, because there were lots of times we had a 4-1 vote. At the, in the first several months. It was four to one, four to one, four to one. And I would simply, during board member comments, read the reason I voted the way I did. I also then maintained a website. So I had a campaign website. I turned it into my board seat website. I was definitely ridiculed and uh, told that, that that's not okay. We're supposed to let the board president speak for the board and that we're supposed to support, uh, support whatever the board votes for. Once you vote, you have to support it, right? That's what we were told in our training. And I said, no, I, I did swear an oath, and that oath was to support the U.S. Constitution and the Constitution of the state of Ohio, and I think I'm going to do that. So you have your voice. Board president, I don't agree with you. So I'm going to voice my opinion that differs from yours, and I'm going to put it on my website. So at almost every meeting, I said, and my, uh, my explanation for the reason I voted the way I did is on coalsforeducation.com. And I tried to say that three times during each meeting. Yes, it irritated them because I had a voice. And I said, look, guys, if the state of Ohio just wanted one voice, they would have one board member. But instead, they have five of us. And it doesn't mean that I get, my voice gets neutered at the door. My voice is still important. The people voted me in here to, to convey their message to you. I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to do it on my website. So for a while, they had a lot of those Elmer Fudd moments, like, oh, that darn Coles. <laughs> and they got over it because they saw that their, their meanness was not going to stop me from speaking. And as often as, you know, when somebody's mean to you, when a bully kind of punches you or pushes you, you want to do the same back, what I would advise every board member to do is kind of stop yourself and think, how can I convey a message that would be acceptable to them? Knowing what I know now is that they don't like me, and that's okay. I don't really care because the students matter. The rest of the board members, not so much. The community that's sitting in the audience, which are not usually the ones <laughs> that voted for me, um, not so much. That I have one boss, and uh, he's not sitting next to me uh, as these board members, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I'm told to do. I'm going to keep going on that path because the students matter. So um, my experience, I'm kind of telling you about that. Uh, I would just voice the opinion that I had. Like, for example, meeting one, we were voting in another $830,000 to be spent on the health insurance policy because it had gone up. And I said, well, I don't think that that's what the community wants us to do. I think they want us to spend differently. That's why they failed four levies in a row. So I think uh, we need to listen to them. We need to ask them, what would you like us to do? Our health insurance has gone up another million dollars. We're going to cover $830,000 of that. I said, I don't think that's what they're telling us to do. So my vote is no tonight. Uh, we voted on quite a few things, and I would vote no. For example, the five-year forecast. I don't know if all of your school districts do that, but I was asking lots of questions, and of course they don't like those questions, but you know, it's my job. I said, look, I'm asking them in public because I want the public to know that I'm asking these questions. Your answers are your answers. My questions are my questions, and I will print my questions on my website, coalsforeducation.com. And uh, <laughs> of course... Of course, they didn't like that. But, but my questions remain. Why are you forecasting, you know, a 25% increase in personnel expenses? Are we expecting some influx of incoming families? Or what's the reason for that? And I didn't like their answers. So I said no to the five-year forecast because I said I'm not going to approve something that I fundamentally disagree with. And, and number two, I don't understand. I'm just a person in the public. That's not my expertise, but I should be able to understand why we forecast the way we do. And if I don't, I can't then put my name on it. And I think that other board members could understand that I'm not going to approve something that, one, you haven't made clear to me. Two, you haven't given me enough time to do my homework to find out the details. And three, I just fundamentally disagree with. Okay, so I'm going to stick to that. Those are my principles. But one of the things I did, guys, that I think gained their confidence in me was I did repeat, repeatedly say that my interest is in educating children. I want the children to come first in everything we do. 
and obviously then that might be some, making some different decisions than what we're making. I would say things like, guys, explain to me how tenure helps children learn, and I'll support it. I came from higher ed. I taught for 10 years in higher ed. I said, I've seen myself how tenure does not help people learn. It does protect teachers who need to be gone, and it kind of muzzles junior faculty. And we don't really like that, do we? And they agreed. So I would work on my narrative that explained to the other board members why I felt the way I did and why I think we should look at some things. And a tough subject like tenure, that's a tough one because we've always just given it, right? Continuing contract, they're just signed. Boards just approve them. So I said, well, I just want to know why, how tenure helps children learn. And I will be with you. I will support it. No one said a word at that table. Not one administrator could explain that. I said, so I think we should look at doing away with it. And they said, well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I said, well, let's just ask legal counsel. Legal counsel comes in. By the way, I'm not a fan of most of them. But they came in and explained to us how you have to give them tenure or you have to have a pile of reasons that you're denying tenure. So then I convinced those other four board members that we need new legal counsel. And I gave them my reasons that we probably need new legal counsel. And the reason was, again, I stuck to that. I want to put the children first. And I said, every time legal counsel advises us, they protect the adults, the input, right? They're protecting the input. I'm looking at the outcome. But, and I would say that. I would, wouldn't say it as articulately as AJ did. But I would say that, you know, I want to know how this is impacting the children's education. Um, so we interviewed new legal firms. They agreed that we probably need to look at new legal firms. We interviewed new legal firms. Three of them said the same thing. Well, you, it's state law. You have to give them tenure if they apply unless you have some you know, huge amount of reasons that you're denying. So the fourth legal firm that came in, I said, okay, we, we, wanna, we wanna stop d giving tenure. Can you tell us how to do that? He said, well, you have to have a reason. I said, well, we don't believe in it. He said, I can defend that. And we said, you're hired. So for three years, this is with the four people that didn't like me, right? For three years, we gave nobody tenure. Nobody applied, because we said we don't believe in it. So state law, the first legal counsel would tell us, well, state law says, Second legal counsel, state law says. So often I would say, okay, that's, that's good news. I'd like to know that. Can you send me the link to that state law? I'd like to go ahead and look at it. And of course they couldn't because there was no such thing, right? So I, I often backed them into a corner and said, just, just give us you know, the law, the link to the law, and we'll go ahead and read it. My other four board members that didn't like me started believing me started trusting me because I did the homework and I would bring the rest of the evidence back to them on why we weren't told the whole story. They started getting angry with the administrative staff for making fools of them in public because they would often parrot what the administration told them. But that's how they were coached. They weren't coached to do anything different from just parroting whatever they were told. So all of a sudden, I started giving them the rest of the information and I did it in a respectful way. I simply repeated myself to them that I know you're voting your conscience, but I want you to understand I'm doing the same. But I'm always gonna try to go do my homework and I'm gonna come back with information that maybe you already know, maybe you don't know. So I spoke to them with trust that I knew that their motives were pure and I spoke to them with respect and they started then respecting me back. So at first it wasn't that way. So I want you to go back to your boards, newly elected or not, and just show them that you have respect for their opinions, but here's some more information that they might use to make their decision, right? And that's all I did. So we did a lot, guys. We stopped giving administrators their bonuses. We stopped a lot. Because I said, we have made the case to the public that we are so broke, if we don't get this $30 million, the children will get stupid. And I don't think that's true. <laughs> Yeah, they, they laughed sometimes, too, at the things I said, but they knew I was saying it jokingly. Our children aren't going to get stupid, but they were claiming that, you know, everything would fall apart in the district unless they got the cash. And I said, I don't think it's the cash we're missing. I think it's some accountability, but let's focus on that. I would say things in public, which the school board association told us do not air dirty laundry in public. I didn't think that outcomes were dirty laundry. 
So I would often mention them in public. The audience would be very quiet. I'd say, well, is anybody else concerned that 24% of our students don't meet the minimum competencies to get into college? So if you look at the paperwork, the, what it says is remediation free. I simply would turn that narrative into something that was a little bit more understandable to the average Joe, right? So if you said remediation free, most people just go, okay, I don't know what that means, but I'm going on with my day. If I said don't meet minimum competencies to get into college, now they understood that. And at the time, Springboro was the best of the best, one of the best academically in the state. And when I said one in four of our students who take the ACT don't meet the minimum competencies to get into college, now they were upset. One, that I said it in public, but that's the only way it got attention. My board members were not upset. My board members were saying, okay, yeah, that's a problem. How are we going to address it? And so we just started having the conversation. So sometimes you have to say things in public that maybe they're not happy with, but it does get the attention it needs. They started, I think the other board members understood that I'm in this, not for the praise, because I got none of that. <laughs> I got lots of people at the podium telling me what a bad person I was. But I said, well, you know, I'm here for the kids. I got five of them in here. It's, I didn't just reproduce myself five times. I'm interested in their future, you know. So I, I want them to succeed, and I want every student to succeed. Tell me how, you know, what you're saying is relevant to moving students forward on the outcome base, uh, basis, okay? I also then shared quite a few things with my other board members, things they didn't know. And I think they were maybe a little bit self-conscious that they weren't doing the homework on their own, but I said, it's okay, I've got the time. I've got the researchers out there. I would call some of my friends and say, I'm looking for such and such. You know where I can find that? You call the uh, Kansas Department of Education. Tell them the same thing. I'm looking for these outcomes. Can you give them to me? I would often ask our superintendent. Unfortunately, I would get partial pieces of information, only the parts he wanted me to have. And uh, there were several newspaper articles about how I was a bully and a micromanager because I was asking these questions. And they didn't print what I said, which was, but I do it with a smile. <laughs> they printed that um, I just said, look, I do ask questions. If a administrative staff person is uncomfortable with that, then maybe they should move on. Because my job is to ask these questions. And that's all I did. I never commanded anybody on what to do. But I said, we have a problem, let's address it. Today in Ohio, 75% of our students don't meet the minimum competencies to get into college. So yeah, and in, in Springboro, it's a lot higher. But once I said that in public, the next year, our percent went down to 14%. So there were improvements and attention made to those deficiencies. So sometimes you have to say it out loud. They don't necessarily like it. You will get pushback, but again, you're there for the kids, and it, as long as you convey that message, that outcome is the reason we're here. It's not football. It's not to get more people to the football stadium. <laughs> it's not soccer. It's outcomes, and that's what I'm looking at. Who could argue with that? So you want a message in a way that nobody can argue with you, and it might be to turn things around from what you normally say. Like when somebody was viciously attacking me at the podium, it's, it's often our instinct to, to attack back. But I was uh, talking to some friends of mine and just say, okay, here's, here's how I'm gonna respond. And they said, why do you care? Just say thanks for your opinion. Have a seat. Because <laughs> they're not gonna derail you from your outcome-based job, right? And I would say, look, if my job as a, as a board member is to write policy, bylaws, vision, mission, strategic plan, hire, fire, and evaluate the superintendent, how can I possibly do that if I don't know the details? So that was my reason for asking all the questions. And that's all I did was ask questions so that I can convey that information to my board members. They started doing some of their own homework. When they would call me and say, hey, Kelly, what about this? I'd say, oh, that's a great question. Why don't you go call so-and-so? And they would, and they'd come back with that homework. So I got them really engaged in doing that homework. And we would often ask the administration, you know, wh what else can we, can we look at as far as outcome? They liked it. They liked the data. I was thinking they just wanted to show up and be feckless bobbleheads. It turns out they didn't mind doing the job either. Once they said, okay, I can, I can participate in this. It, it turned out great. Messaging is key 
for all of you, I would uh, advise you, if you go to NSBLC, I have cards, I think, somewhere for you, but NSBLC, National School Board Leadership Council, which is my website, all of the training on there is free. And I talk about messaging. I talk about finding district details, finding your district financials, finding your district report cards. Every state Department of Education should have that information. You won't necessarily get it from your administrative staff. But some of the things that I would ask, let me see if I can get this to move. Where am I supposed to point this, by the way? Over there. Gotcha. It's not moving. There we go. Uh, messaging uh, types of information, the state and district um, academic and financial information. Again, you should be able to get that from your administration, but you might not get all the pieces. So I would suggest, well, I suggest that you go ahead and go to the uh, Kansas Department of Education and ask them. And they always guided me, guys. I didn't know if they would, but they always said, okay, click on this, then click on this, then click on this, and there you go. And there's descriptions of what each of those mean. It was wonderful. And I told my board members that. They didn't know that. They didn't know they could get a lot of information so that we can start asking our questions about this stuff. So the actual district data, like academic ratings over time, and I thought that was important to show. When I would show the other school board members that information, they go, huh. Yeah, we're declining in reading, and it's in sixth grade. So what's going on in sixth grade? It was wonderful. You know, at the end of my four years, towards the end, I knew I was not going to rerun. I knew that I had to, as my directive was given to me, I had to go travel at least the state of Ohio and tell people what was happening in public education. So I did. Uh, that's what I did. And, and my husband was saying, you know, could you just, like, get a job? <laughs> <laughs> bring in some income and instead I said no I, I have to do this he goes I know I know you do you have to so I just traveled the state of Ohio giving presentations on why education is failing our students and it's mostly because the boards aren't holding the system accountable at all one they don't know the information and they don't know how to get it so I was helping them find how to get the information uh, but two they're intimidated it's much easier to walk into that board meeting sit down and just say yes 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 if you say let's have a conversation about this topic, that's not necessarily popular. And sometimes the board, other board members would roll their eyes, but when I started talking and giving logical reasons for my vote, they started having trouble defending their vote. So they started just saying, okay, how, how are we, what are we doing on this one, Kelly? <laughs> In two years, the community hired two more people that I recommended, and I became the board president for the next two years. So very much a turnaround, but again, it was gaining confidence from the community and from the rest of the board. And yes, we went through some superintendents and treasurers because they didn't like being asked the questions. I think, well, that's not my problem. You know, my problem is the outcome. And I'm going to stay on the questions until we get there. The newspaper, who had really hated on me for three years, <laughs> finally wrote an article saying that after, after three years, the academics in Springboro went up every year that I was there, while the price tag per pupil went down every year that I was there. Not mentioning my name, necessarily. <laughs> we actually reduced property taxes by $1.5 million. That's another story I don't have time tonight, but I could tell you how we did that. Um, anyway, these are all the things you might want to look for. Tough but important subjects to discuss is faculty and staff, I mean, you're just asking questions. Do we have the right size classrooms? And, um, you know, do we need more staff? Or are we kind of overstaffed? Can we put some on part-time? There were lots of questions that I would ask. And we did cancel some classes. We'd say, okay, I think the board has a philosophy that if we don't have 10 students in a classroom, we probably need to cancel that one or get the counselors to start shuffling more kids into that one. Um, but if we have more than, it depended on the grade level, but if we have more than 32 in a high school class, then we probably need to start another class. You know, we would have those kinds of conversations because I would look up the evidence. I would look up the research on class size and how it impacts learning. Certainly because we had lots of people complaining that we had 32 students in a class and they couldn't possibly teach that many students. And I said, I believe you, teacher. I believe you. That's, that sounds reasonable. Why do we have 32 in a classroom? 
right? So I trusted the teachers. I trusted their input. They didn't necessarily like me, but <laughs> that's okay. If they wanted to give me input, I wanted to listen. I always said, I have an open door. Come talk to me. And they'd say, I can't teach 32 students. Well, I found out by doing some homework that in one sixth grade building where they were complaining about having classes that large, that uh, we had enough teachers and we had enough classrooms, the reason that they were bunching them into 32 per classroom was because all the teachers got an extra hour off every day. And they did it on purpose to pass the levy so that everybody in there would go out and tell the public that we were crammed into these spaces. Once I made that public to the other board members who got very angry at administration for doing that, and the administration admitted, oh, okay, we did it to make a point, meaning they did it to pass the levy said, you're telling me you can't possibly teach 32 students in a class, and then you tell me you did it on purpose. See how we have a problem with that? We have a crisis of confidence in this district. And so I think that superintendent left. But that's okay. That's okay. Maybe they need to move on. If that's the kind of games we're playing with students learning, then, yeah, we've got the wrong administrative staff. Okay, so uh, curriculum content. I think that's a great conversation to have. I loved what AJ said about you've got to convey the message from your community. Let's look at their goals. Let's look at their values, their principles. And we've got to be a school district that reflects that. And so I would often advocate for community input. And if the superintendent would stack that community input group, if you've ever seen that happen, they stack them with their picks, <laughs> who are just going to say, yeah, we want what he wants, right? I'd say, well, no, that's not what they're telling me. They tell me everywhere I go. So yes, five kids, I'm on the soccer field, I'm on the baseball field, I'm in Kroger's. <laughs> you know, I talk to these people all the time and that is not what they're saying. They're saying the curriculum is an issue. This new Common Core math is an issue. Lots of these things. Um, types of information to share, articles by experts, did a lot of that. I'm gonna show you one or two. Community comments, share with them what you're hearing in the community. Uh, you can do it on a, I don't recommend a Facebook page because on a Facebook page you can't control the message. But if you do it on a website, you get to control the message. So I would advise a website rather than Facebook page. Uh, some of these I'm going to show you, some of these are just comments that I would share with the rest of the board. Say this is from this famous think tank and here's what some of their experts have to say. So I would share those articles. I would simply send them as an FYI to my other board members. Again, I think that's how I, I gain trust from them, is that here's what I'm looking for, here's what I'm learning, and I'm just gonna share it with you. There's no demand for you to vote a certain way. I'm simply educating you. And I think they, they got that. Uh, I also explained how I see it, which was that the Board of Education, here it is right in front of me, Board of Education is in the middle of a very thick shell. The people who often talk to them are the superintendent, the treasurer, legal counsel, OSBA, which was a school board association, and the union. Often those are the voices that most of the school board members are hearing. So they don't get to hear these little people at the bottom, which is community parents, citizens, and seniors. They don't typically, or students, sorry, they don't typically get to talk to them very much. So I would just say, look, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to hold this little open house at my house. I'm going to go talk to these students. I'm going to go to this event where it's just a bunch of students. We're all having breakfast. And you start doing those things so that you can talk to the people that aren't currently represented. And I would simply say, look, guys, the people inside the district are represented. The people outside the district are not and that's my job, and I'm gonna stick to that. And, and they would agree with that. So it's again, it's messaging back to your other board members as to why you're doing what you're doing, and they often said that makes sense, luckily. I would give them information like this. Okay, are we spending enough? And I would show this as the Springboro budget. Boom, yep, we've definitely spent more than our share. This is inflation-adjusted spending on education. Um, and I get a lot of this from the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute. And I would share that. I did some charts showing the household income change over the last five years and the district average salary change over five years and then inflation. And they saw how the community is saying no because they can't afford it. And then I would show them this. Just I want to do this real quick. This is proficiency. So when you talk about proficiency, don't people want to know what that means? Look at the middle row where it says proficient. Under there you see third grade math, 49%, fourth grade math, um, 40, 38%. I, I went ahead and shared this with my board. I said proficient means that a student passes the test, the standardized test, with a 49% or better. 
38% in fourth grade math. If you know what proficient means, I don't think most of us would call that proficient. If I told the public that your student is proficient and then they learn later that their student got a 38%, I think they're gonna be a little upset with me. So I, I just wanted to stop using school speak. And I said, let's stop using school speak and let's have honest conversations about performance. When we say a student is proficient, we're not sure what that means. But it means that they could fail the test or better. I don't think that's being honest. Here's some more. Just more data. The red blocks are, uh, you know, pretty bad news. And I would find this on the Department of Education, the State Department of Education. You share this with your other board members and they'll say, okay, we have a problem. Let's address it. That's all you're saying. You're not going to beat anybody up with this information. You're going to say, let's address it. How are we going to address it, superintendent? You know. Okay, this is, this is the goals. We just want to train school board members. Um, I'm not in this for, you know, uh, for the money, because all of our training is free. But I love the help that we get from the Kansas Policy Institute and the uh, Kansas School Board. Hold on, let me get it right. Kansas School Board Resource Center. Love what you're doing. Applaud what you're doing. And we have at least another 10 states across the country who are doing something very similar. So maybe we can fix this education problem that we have. Thank you, guys.